Good morning. If you are a member of one of my congregations, you've probably already see, received a packet for this Lenten season. This packet was inspired by a book that I purchased um, over 30 years ago called Journey to Jerusalem. Actually, it probably shows um, backwards on the screen, but this is the book. Back then, I was serving as an associate pastor at First Presbyterian Church of Edgewood, and we used this book uh, to shape an all-church retreat that we did and held near Ligonier. Well, over the years, I've wanted to revisit this extraordinary journey through the Holy Lands of Christ and his life. And at some point last year, when I realized that we probably would not be back to in-person worship during this Lenten season, I began for I began to look for a copy of this book that I had um, in my library and I could not find it anywhere because um, I wanted to recreate again um, this uh, take-home packet like I had done for Advent. Um, anyway, I could not find my copy of the book anywhere. I looked all over in my library at home and at the office, um, looked in books or in boxes and couldn't find it. So with only the title to go by and a clear vision of what the cover of the book looked like, um, I first searched online for a new copy of the book, but came up empty handed. Uh, but then I reached out to the social media mind, collective mind, to see if anyone else could remember this book or knew who the author was um, and which book I was referring to. And more importantly, if they had a copy of that book. Evidently, there are many books by the title Journey to Jerusalem. And although I got lots of helpful suggestions, none of them were the correct book that I was looking for. Until my friend Vivian sent me a text message saying, I found it. <laughs> and indeed she had. Um, it was in a used bookstore somewhere in Alabama <laughs> that had an online catalog of their inventory. So I ordered it immediately and was delighted when it arrived. <laughs> I was very, very excited to see this book again after so long. But 30 years is a really long time to uh, misremember the contents of a book. And actually to the book's credit for the impact that it made on me 30 years ago, much of it was exactly as I remembered it. But my re-remembering re of the book over those 30 years had given it sort of a life of its own and a different twist from its original um, content. Anyway, um, I took the book and all of that I remembered and how I had reshaped it in my mind and created a take-home packet for Lent, which all of you should have received by now. This packet that you have received is sort of a combination of what I found most exciting about that book and my own vision of this journey that we are going to take during the Lenten season of 2021. Lent is always a journey. It has its roots when we begin to celebrate the coming of the Lord in Advent, but really takes off after Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River by John. When the Holy Spirit of God drove Jesus out into the wilderness to begin his own journey of ministry and mission. This week, Lent begins. It's a time for us to deeply contemplate our own season of trial and temptation, of our purpose, of our own ministries and mission that we are on, 
So I hope that you join me this Lenten season on this journey that we are on with Christ as he moves about the countryside of Judea, enters quite a number of small villages around the area while he teaches and preaches and heals and ultimately when he winds his way to the cross and the tomb. Places, places destined for him alone. Each stop along the way on our journey has a brochure, which is full of helpful historical information about that place and that time and what Jesus did there. And it ties Jesus to place and time for us so that we have a better understanding of who he was and his own discoveries that he found himself. What's wonderful about the 21st century, which is a whole lot different than 30 years ago, is our ability to travel via the internet to places and times all over the world. So I do implore you to take advantage of the websites and the YouTube clips that are included in each brochure to gain a fuller appreciation for the journey that Jesus took. It is a fascinating world, a fascinating place and time that Jesus lived. So please take advantage of those links and um, either type them into your web browser or go back online on this blog site and find those clips for each day. Now our scripture passages this week for our time of worship this Sunday include the story of God's promise to Noah after the flood, which affected the whole earth and devastated all living things upon the earth. I wonder, is there a correlation for us to think about that we might make for today's pandemic? Is there a promise of hope after we've witnessed the death so far of two and a half million people around the world? from this virus. We might wonder, what was the mood after the flood? In Genesis, God promises never again to flood the earth. But what about other natural disasters that we experience in our lifetimes, like our current pandemic? Do they count just a little? I wonder. The flood itself and the covenant that God makes here in this passage in Genesis reminds us that God's redemption is merely, isn't merely human souls, but rather all creatures, all of creation. St. Francis, St. Francis actually reminds us of this because he understood our kinship with um, our brothers and sisters, the birds, the fish, wolves, cattle, flowers, trees. He sang it in his canticle and enacted it by preaching to creatures. You know, he went out into the wilderness and preached to no one in particular, just to the birds and the trees. Perhaps these things, such as pandemics, serve as a wake-up call to all of us to care more fully and more completely for God's whole creation, for all of God's creatures, both human and otherwise. The rainbow that God sends after the flood, I think is an opening for us to talk about signs. You know, we love signs. We want to be shown signs to help us more clearly know what to believe, what decisions to make, how to gather our thoughts. But we don't always see the right signs. We tend to see the signs we're looking for. And we don't always interpret them correctly. Seeing a rainbow is a lovely reminder of God's ultimate mercy for us. But so are the trees and the flowers and the birds, as Jesus pointed out in his Sermon on the Mount. 
so too are the connections that we have with one another, the faces of our friends, our loved ones, and even the faces of strangers that are walking by us on the street, and the unknown faces of the world around us. They are a reminder to us of all God's creation. They are all signs of God's magnificent benevolence and love. So now if we turn to our passage in Mark, in the first chapter of Mark, we move from God's promise for all of creation that we saw in Genesis to a much more personal promise and a blessing that God had. Notice in Mark that the blessing comes directly to Christ. It is second person speech, not this is my beloved like we see in some of the other gospels, but rather you are my beloved. I kind of like that. It is very personal. In this journey of Lent, God made a promise to all of creation. But God also makes a promise, a personal promise, at Christ's baptism. You. You are my beloved. God invites us to be Jesus' body and hear God say directly to us, you, yes, you, are my beloved. God not only cares about the creation as a whole entity, but God also cares about the individual creature too. God cares about you. You are God's beloved. Knowing that, knowing that we are loved, helps us on a journey that can lead us into the unknown that might lead us into some scary places, that might lead us to places that we would rather not go. And just like Christ, before he began his journey, God reached out and said to him, you are my beloved. Also saying in that promise and blessing, there is nothing to fear. I will always be with you. So within that lovely promise, there is a bit of anxiousness, I think, as well. For also in Mark, notice his words and the vivid, the heavens were torn apart in Mark chapter 1, verse 10. Donald Jewell, who was a professor of New Testament theology at Princeton Theological Seminary, reflected on that passage and observed that what is opened can be closed again, but what is torn apart cannot easily return to its former state. Interesting. I believe Mark writes this and writes it in this way on purpose so that we don't become too complacent in our knowledge that we are beloved. We shouldn't relax. There is work to be done. We can't go back to the way things were. As much as we'd like, we can't go back. We're on a journey. And journeys, regardless of their route, always, always lead forward. They don't lead back. They might be a journey of remembrances to places that we once lived, or worked or visited, but they even then are in the present and the future. We can never return to the past. So what does our present and future look like? What journey are we really on? Well, then in Mark, it says that the Spirit immediately. Remember what I said about Mark in the past? Jesus is always in a hurry in Mark because everything in Mark is urgent. Then the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. We have our marching orders, so to speak. 
we cannot rest. We are on a journey, and the journey is beckoning us forward. The wilderness in Mark could be seen as the challenges that we all face, every single one of us. This pandemic season might feel like a wilderness. It certainly is. But it's a place, a zone, a time of testing. What is it testing us for? Jesus was driven out, but he also chose to be driven out. What would it mean for us to see ourselves as driven into a time of testing, to choose it, to purify the self, shedding the crutches that we've relied on for too long, and relying for a time solely on God. You know, it's interesting to note that in Mark, he doesn't do those three boxing rounds with the devil that we see in Matthew and Luke. Here, it does say that he was tempted by the devil, but then he's with the wild beasts. I think that sounds scary enough, maybe even scarier than verbal jousting with the devil. Leap off a temple? Yeah, that's an easy one to say no to. But a couple of bears growling and drooling behind us, or some predator lying in wait to pounce upon us. These things are the terrors of the night. These are the things that keep us awake. These are the things that wake us from slumber and leave us breathless and anxious for a long time. What are the things that terrify you? The only way to survive such assaults or doubts or self-recrimination or anxiety or grief or a restless night is the remembering of our baptism, the promise and the blessing that we are beloved. Did you know that Martin Luther, when he faced moments of doubt and restlessness, he calmly resisted by simply saying these words, I am baptized. And finally, in this text from Mark, in Christ's beginning journey, it says that the angels waited on him. The verb to wait is always, always theologically suggestive. We wait on the Lord, don't we? It takes time. Watching, expecting, not there yet, but coming. That's exactly the theme of Advent, isn't it? Do the angels wait on Christ in this way? But we also wait on the Lord as in a way a waiter waits on a table, serving. Hosting, helping. What waiting service did the angels provide to Christ? Obviously not food since he was in a time of fasting. Did they wipe his brow? Did they sing him songs, choral anthems of encouragement, calm, inspiration? What angels will wait on you, will assist you on this journey in Lent? What service will they provide for you? Remember, you are the beloved, and you did not go on this journey alone. So I ask you to join me on this new journey for Lent 2021. Where will it lead us? Thanks be to God. Amen.